tiny bit late. Um, I managed to create some technical challenges, I think. Um, but hopefully it'll be worth it for the next 45 minutes or so um, of no slides. That's why we've managed to cause a few problems because um, when we present, we try not to present with slides. We're gonna do, you're gonna see some live drawing lower your expectations right now of how good those drawings are going to be um, but hopefully these visuals will help things to stick will give us a bit of energy post lunch uh, so my name is sarah ellis i'm the co-founder of amazing if everything that our company does is about making careers better for everyone and what i'm going to talk about today is a bit about the context of careers um, very briefly and then i'm going to talk about five skills that i think help everybody now to really think about their career to improve their self-awareness and to really take ownership for their own career development. That's the thing that we're really passionate about is that point about ownership, but also in a very practical way, in a very sort of how-to way. So just to give a little bit of context on careers, you still see lots and lots of articles about careers that have a picture that look a bit like this or a bit like this. So we still talk quite a lot about ladders, and steps and staircases. And the career ladder, it's really interesting, was created about 100 years ago. And it was created for when we first started working in offices. And I think over the past 18 months, we could not be further away from that reality now of all working in offices together for the first time. And career ladders assume a few things that I think don't feel fit for purpose anymore. They assume that we all want to head in the same direction. They assume that it's all about kind of the next step that we have the same view of success. And also they really only worked for the fortunate few, which is why we instead use this description of careers today as being much more squiggly. Uh, now you don't have to use the word squiggly, but I think it's really helpful for us to replace this idea of ladder-like thinking and ladder language and that approach to careers which, with something that recognizes now that our careers will develop in different directions. On average, we can expect to have four or five different types of career during our working life. We know now from research from people like the World Economic Forum that about 40% of the skills that we have today, we're going to be completely reimagining and reinventing in the next couple of years. This idea of learning, unlearning and relearning is just all of our reality. When I first uh, started my career and spent lots of time climbing that ladder and in quite ladder-like organizations, you know, it was all about progress only equaled promotion. It felt really, really binary. And you went to work to learn to do a job. Whereas now I think we go to work and learning is the job. Like we, we all need to get really, really good at kind of learning to learn, which definitely isn't something that kind of I did for the first 10 years or so of my career. So if we think now this squiggly career is both more reflective of all of our experiences, um, that we all have change and uncertainty all the time. There's lots of opportunity and possibilities, but also we're not suggesting that squiggly careers are easy. Of course, there are these knotty moments. There are lots of obstacles to overcome. There's loads that we don't know. We are all more adaptable than we gave ourselves credit for two years ago, I suspect. And so what we really want to help people do, to do is think about what are the skills they can develop for themselves to really make the most of their squiggly careers, to kind of navigate their squiggly careers in a way that works for them, but also to overcome obstacles because we might not be able to control them and we might not know exactly what they are, but we've all experienced restructures. We've all experienced priorities changing. We've all hoped that a certain plan or possibility might emerge and then things change at the last minute. Uh, I really remember one of the interview questions I always got asked in my career was, you know, where do you see yourself in five years' time? And I think now that question, you just feel like that's almost an impossible task to be able to answer. And so we really want to help people move away from thinking of career plans as something that, you know, is very structured and very fixed and very focused on only one destination to really thinking about how do we explore possibilities and how do we make sure rather than destinations, we're helping people with are they developing in the right direction? Are they doing work they find really meaningful? And so we work with organizations all over, the, um, all over the world, people like Microsoft and BBC and the Vodafone, and we think we've trained about 100,000 people in the, uh, in the last year, particularly because we've been doing so many things virtually. And there are five areas that we keep coming back to that we think provide really good foundations 
for people to take ownership for their career development. Of course, there are way more things than I'm going to talk about today, but these five are a pretty good starting point um, in our experience. And what I thought I'd do today is talk you through each of the five pretty quickly um, and talk about some ideas for action that I really hope that you can use, but also perhaps you can share with the people you work with, the organisations you work in, and some coach yourself questions as well. So I suspect most of you here today, you'll be able to see what I'm going to talk you through uh, through two different lenses. Hopefully, this will be useful for you. Some of this uh, today, you'll be able to think, well, what does this mean for me? And what actions might I take? But also have that other um, perspective in mind of how might this be useful for the people I work with? So I'm going to start by talking a little bit about strengths. And in particular, about how we know, grow, and show our strengths at work. Then we're going to talk a bit about values. I think of values as a bit like a career compass. You're really starting to see some of these drawings in action now. And values are things that motivate and drive you. And how do we get people to think a bit about their values in an accessible way through the work that we do? Values can feel quite abstract, I think. How can we make them really practical? We're then going to talk a bit about confidence. Confidence and self-belief in squiggly careers. Uh, it's probably only becoming more important because to navigate those squiggles and some of those ones that, are, that feel out of our control, it can, it can feel like it can knock our confidence, understandably, with all the amount of change that we're all having to cope with and the uncertainty. So we focus less on the kind of confidence stuff on the surface, so um, the words you use or your body language, and we look much more at what helps to build long-term self-belief for people in their careers. So that how do you build your resilience reserves so they're there when you need them. That's the bit that I always find really interesting. Then, a uh, slightly love-hate topic, but one that's really important, about creating your career community and networking. Um, now, I'm an introvert, and I think when you think about networking, maybe actually you imagine something that kind of looks a little bit like this, so lots of people maybe you don't know or you've not met before. But I think for us, we define networking as people helping people. And of all the five areas I'm going to talk about, it's probably the one where the definition matters the most. Because I think when people reframe networking, particularly if it's something they get nervous about or are not sure about as people helping people, it opens up what we think about and how we approach our career community. And the people you build your relationships with are so important in a squiggly career because those relationships belong to you. They're something you can control those uh, strong ties that you develop will support you, those people will sponsor you, and some of those people perhaps you meet along the way, what was sometimes described as weak ties, those are the people that will spot new possibilities and new opportunities. So we really want to, have, I think, help everyone to find a way of networking that works for them. And then last, talk a little bit about moving away from this idea of career plans to exploring possibilities to how do we help people have curious career conversations? How do we make it okay? How do we give people permission to be able to have those conversations about where your career might take you, what you could do, what are you interested in, what are you intrigued by, and can we improve the quality of career conversations that we're all having inside and outside our organizations? Because again, that opens up our thinking and recognizes all of our realities. So they're the five areas we're gonna talk about. I'm going to start off a bit with strengths um, and appreciate for those of you at home, this is a bit trickier, um, but I'm going to do a bit of a poll uh, across the room. I'd be really interested to know whether you think you spend more time making your strengths stronger. So this is more time making your strengths stronger. Or do you think you spend more time worrying about your weaknesses? So quick, quick show of hands. Hands up if you think you spend more time making your strengths stronger. Hands up if you think you spend more time worrying about your weaknesses. Okay, I reckon as a group, and maybe it's slightly impacted by who, who decides to come today, I reckon we got a 70-30 split there. So more people thinking about how do you make your strength stronger, which is brilliant. That is exactly the kind of environment we want to create for everybody. It's not ignoring weaknesses, and I think sometimes we mistake this for thinking, oh, well, we just forget about those weaknesses. I think when I think about the things that we are not as good at, I think it's really important that we are distinctive about well, what are the skills or the areas that I need to get good enough at and where do I want to be great? So good enough versus great. And have we thought really clearly about the difference between those two things? And are we investing our energy in the right area? And that point about energy um, is an important one. 
When we think about strengths, we think about the things that give you energy. So when I think about strengths and the things you really want to be known for, the people you, the things you want to be recommended for, the thing you want to build your reputation for, I think about well, what are the things that give you energy, even if you're not great at them yet. And sometimes there are things that we are really that we really enjoy, where we find our flow, but perhaps because of things like confidence or comparison, we don't see them as strengths because we think, oh, but. Um, Helen over there is better at that thing than me, or Tom over there is better, so it couldn't be one of my strengths. And I think we really want to encourage everyone to think about, well, if it gives you energy, you can get better at it, you can invest in it, you can make your strengths stronger. None of our strengths stand still. We don't want them to stall. We want to keep investing in them. So do we all know, and do the people that we work with and the teams that we support, do people know what gives them energy? And equally, weaknesses are things that deplete your energy, and again, even if you're good at them, I think we all sometimes fall into that trap of sometimes doing lots of things that we are good at, because we're good and we're all very adaptable and flexible, but does it give you energy? Is it something you want to spend more time on? And just maybe a slightly different way of framing strengths um, to help us think a little bit about them. So two um, ideas for action for you on strengths. One about helping people to know their strengths. So perhaps something, you know, people who are actually just getting started with strengths, or you just really want to, you've not reflected on this idea of energy before, this one will help. And then the second one is um, more about how you can help other people to do the hard work for you. So the first idea is this idea of an energy audit. And really taking a week and making a note of all the moments that increase your energy in your day. So where do you come out of a meeting or a project or a moment in your day, and you're asking yourself, when did I have the most energy today? And, and what was happening? And who was I with? And what was I working on? Asking yourself lots of those open questions to give you a sense of what are all those things that are creating energy in me, where I'm most likely to find flow and to do my best work. And equally, it can sometimes be useful to kind of go, what's depleting my energy? If you really want to think about kind of what takes your energy away. And often we don't spend very much time building our self-awareness day to day. Sometimes we take a moment maybe at the end of a month or we suddenly think, I've not spent any time on my own personal development and then we think, oh, I'll do half an hour on a Friday. But what does that half an hour on a Friday end up being? Those three things on your to-do list that you've not quite got to. And so I think anything we can do to make development part of people's every day is really, really valuable. And it's part of the work rather than separate to the work. And this is where I think energy audits can work really well because we're basically saying to people, five minutes at the end of a day, what gave you the most energy today and why? And you're just increasing people's self-awareness generally, but also their awareness of strengths and what they really enjoy and the type of work they enjoy. The other thing on strengths, and I'm sure lots of you have done lots of work on this, is about getting strengths-based feedback, asking, giving and receiving strengths-based feedback. And I always really like um, this very simple question, which is focused on when you see people at their best. And so often, other people can see us more clearly than we can see ourselves. And so a really good question that we can ask and give each other in terms of strengths-based feedback is, what three words would you use to describe me at my best? It's a really simple, really revealing exercise. Um, you can do it with friends. You can do it with people you've worked with in the past. You can do it with people you work with now. And you can do it really, really quickly. What three words would you use to describe me at my best? And what it really helps us with is the difference between intent and impact. So if you think now, what, are those, what would you like those three words to be? So you'll probably have in your head. So I would be thinking, OK, ideas, um, enthusiasm, and maybe building brilliant relationships or something like that. Appreciate that's not one word. But what, what do you want those three words to be? And that's your intent. That's what you want to be known for. That's what you want to be recognised for and build your reputation for. Then, when you ask for this feedback, you can work out, does your intent match your impact? And we want those things to be consistent. So, do people see things that surprise you? Maybe some things you'd underappreciated because they're natural talents of yours, and you're, you're just sort of, you sort of take them for granted almost, so sometimes it's harder to see them. Do you start to realise that perhaps some of those things that you're good at but don't give you energy are showing up really consistently. And that might prompt you to take some action and to think about doing something slightly differently. 
my, um, my co-founder, Helen, used to work for Microsoft, and she used to run massive events for like 10,000 people globally. And she started to get known as like the person who could bring together and was like super organized and efficient at making these events happen. And she, though she was good at it, it didn't give her energy. And so when she did this exercise, um, and we've done it, I do this all the time, she started to get words back like organized or kind of like the go-to person who's like super efficient. And she was saying, that's not, that's not what I want to develop in terms of making my strength stronger. So then you can, you've got some choices, you've got some decisions to make about how you spend your time. So I think just knowing that all of our brains have a natural negativity bias. Now you were all really positive today, so um, you probably know some of this stuff and you've probably worked on this stuff, but remembering so many people that we work with, they are their own worst critic. And we, if you can give someone strengths-based feedback and just say, um, I thought you were brilliant in that meeting because turn that positive praise into strengths-based feedback. It can make someone's day and it can make all the difference. So if you're feeling really good about all of this for yourself, think about well, what could you do for other people? How often are you giving uh, strengths-based feedback? And just a really good coach yourself question, what do I want people to recommend me for? So let's imagine um, we met today and we're getting to know each other. I'm then connecting you to someone else over email. What do you want me to be saying in that email in terms of Sarah is great at? or you can, always, you can always rely on Helen for, or Tom is brilliant at problem solving. You know, what, what are those things that we are building our reputation for? Let's talk a little bit about values. As I said, I see values as acting a bit like a career compass, and I think they help us all in a few um, different ways. I think they really help with choices. So rather than what we should do, or what we could do, or what people expect us to do, I think our values help us to have the bravery to make the right decision for you, based on what motivates and drives you. Some of the bravest decisions I've made in my career, I don't think I could have made if I hadn't known my values and felt confident that those decisions were really aligned with what motivates and drives me. And just to give you an example, some of those decisions are very different decisions. So when I was working at Sainsbury's, I asked to work a four-day week so I could spend one day on Amazing If, our business. That was a little while ago now. And at that time, very few people worked a four-day week. And the people that did, all did it for what I saw as like proper reasons, like looking after their kids. And I was like, oh, I sort of want to go and play with my business that wasn't really a business. It was a hobby, if anything. Um, oh, and at the same time, I was also applying for a promotion. Oh, so I'd like you to promote me, and I'd like to work a four-day week, please. And that felt really brave and... <laughs> Uh, very ambitious and also I couldn't really see any role models of anyone else doing those kind of things around me but I knew it aligned really really well with my values so it gave me the bravery to at least ask and and then you see you see where that goes or even now working in our own company versus working in the big organizations that I'm much more used to when I was really thinking about am I ready to do that am I going to enjoy that again using my values um, as a lens to look at decisions has been really really helpful I think helping people with their understanding their values is really, really useful. I think it also helps you with those challenges, with those knotty moments, um, and sometimes they you know, can be quite big knots along the way. So when you do have those moments of restructure or redundancy, I think it helps you to understand why you're feeling as you're feeling, but also to find your way through it. And I think when you can know your values, you can, you can figure out and you can understand what's happening. Often, hard moments in our careers are where our values are missing or in tension. That's pretty consistent. When you look at people's tough moments, often their values are somehow um, in conflict with what's happening. The other thing is that your values stay really constant. I'm sure most of you will know this, but in a world where so much changes, it's quite useful for people to have an anchor in their career to keep coming back to. And here, I'm really talking about your core values, the three or four things that stay very consistent. And then I think the thing that's most underappreciated about values, but I have found really helpful um, in the last three or four big teams that I've led, organizations that I've led, is when we know each other, other's values, our ability to collaborate massively improves. There's loads of, um, you will have watched, I'm sure, talks by people like Simon Sinek, Simon's uh, great talk on start with the why. Lots of emphasis on let's all start with the why before we do anything else. I actually think in terms of teams and high-performing teams, it's more valuable to start with the who before you get to the why. So do we understand who everybody is? Do we understand what motivates and drives everyone? What really matters and motivates each other? 
And once we know that, and once we understand and appreciate each other and have that empathy, then let's get on to, well, why are we all here? What do we need to do? And then how are we going to do it? So I sometimes think we, we move past the who very quickly, or it's a more incidental thing that happens organically over time. And there's no, there's no problem with that, but I think we could be more intentional about, within our teams, creating the time and space to get to know who we all are. Now, you don't always have to do values to do that, and for some teams and some organisations, you don't necessarily even want to use the word values. You might just use what's most important to you. And there's a really interesting example, actually, for those of you who like sport, um, over in the US of an American football team where they were like a team of superstars, I think, but they weren't performing very well, so they weren't winning any games. And what their coach did was essentially got them to do this values exercise where they all sat down and they had to talk about, I think it was their heroes, heartbreaks and hopes. There's kind of this, four, this um, three or four H model. And they just had to talk about those things for a couple of minutes. And what was really interesting is they said they, they discovered things about each other that they didn't know before. They connected with each other on a much more personal and human level outside of what they were trying to achieve on the field. And then, obviously, it's a great success story. The team started doing better. One of the things that we found in terms of values that works really well is one of the things that unites all of us in our careers, and I'm yet to find anyone who's the exception to this rule, is that we all have highs and lows in our career. And if we can encourage people to talk about their highs and their lows and what they learnt from those, you often get really good insights into people's values. And it's a really good introductory exercise into values. How are we doing? So I thought I would share with you um, a high from my career, which people are sort of okay interested in, and then a low, which people are always a lot more interested in. Um, and then see if you can even get a sense of what you think my values might be, given we met about 20 minutes ago. So just, just to tell two very short stories. So one high in my career was when I'd moved to London partway through my career, and I was working for Barclays, working in Canary Wharf, 24th floor of a very big tower block. Um, and I'd always been okay, I'd always quite enjoyed my jobs, and suddenly I found myself in a job that just felt completely different. I think I really found my flow. Some things I loved about that job, no one had done it before, and no one really knew what it was, and so there was a completely blank piece of paper. Now, for some people, I know that's people's worst nightmare. For me, that gets, I, I, I love the idea of just starting from scratch. I love creating new stuff. I love the ability to like, shape something where there's just loads of space. And it was the first time I think I'd had that much autonomy in my career. And I was given a lot of freedom to just like figure out what this job was. It was when this thing called YouTube was starting, which makes me sound really old. Um, and my job was to like do video content and those kind of things for the bank. And so that was kind of, it started off really well. And then I got a brilliant marketing director who every Tuesday would meet me for coffee first thing in central London. Um, and she would just say to me, oh, like Sarah, like what ideas have you got? What's, like, what's on your mind at the moment? And I think inadvertently, she suddenly had opened up basically Pandora's box. I think for the first time in my career, I'd been given the permission to just have ideas, to just like say what I, say what I thought about stuff. Um, and I mean, I absolutely went wild. I was all over. I was like, we could do this, or what about this? And I was just so, I felt it was really kind of creative. I was learning from loads of different interesting people. And I think even when I created some ideas or suggested some ideas that were absolutely stupid, I was never patronised. I was always encouraged. You know, I was always like, OK, well, we might not want to just get rid of the Barclays logo, which was one of my suggestions. We might just want to... But, but I take your point about thinking about how do we make banks more accessible. Maybe let's explore some other routes. So to this day, I'm always very grateful to Sarah Benison, who's now on the board at Nationwide, because she was that person who sort of saw my strengths before I saw them, and who just gave me that space to just spend time with loads of different people and to figure out what I was really good at. On the surface, it wasn't the obvious thing to do in my career. The obvious thing would have been to go and make some TV ads. That's what lots of my peers were doing in marketing at that time. And I sort of went into this weird and wonderful world of digital content um, and had an absolute blast and really loved it. So much so, I remember going on holiday and thinking, well, I can't go on holiday. Like, Barclays is going to fall over. If I go on holiday, like, what, what is going to happen to all of this stuff? Obviously, it was absolutely fine, and I was like the smallish fish um, in the biggest pond. But it was a real high for me, and I remember thinking, if work can feel like this, then this is, this is what feels really meaningful for me. So there's a high. Let's talk a bit more about a low. Um, I love sports, and um, I got a job working for LucasAid. And I loved the job application process. You had to turn up and talk about a brand that you loved. I turned up with mood boards. 
actual mood boards. Now when I think about it, it's so cringy. But I was like, oh, let me talk you through these mood boards. I think they gave me the job because I was so enthusiastic. They probably felt like they couldn't not. I was, I was, I was probably going to turn up anyway. So they were a bit like, we probably should just give her this job because she's, she clearly wants it so much. So I think I killed them with optimism and enthusiasm. Turned up, loved the first eight weeks, learning all about LucasAid. You've got people coming in to tell you how they like, did the formulation of the drinks, um, how they worked out what, dr what, drink, um, what drinks they were going to introduce next, so like new product development, how they were going to market it. And I was like, I love this brand. I love everything it stands for. I love sport. This is the best job. And it was the best job for about 10 weeks. Then I started to do the actual job. Now, the actual job um, was selling LucasAid to leisure centres, offices, hotels, and most of those places had already got LucasAid in a vending machine, and my job was just to sell them more LucasAid. And I'm an introvert who gets nervous meeting new people um, and probably the worst salesperson in the world. All that happened was I built some really good relationships and sold absolutely nothing. Honestly, I had an Astra full of LucasAid. I'd be like traveling around to these places and at times it did get, um, it did get quite bleak because I would literally just be sitting in my car and clue, if you get a car at that point, it's a sales job. I should have definitely figured that out. And just thinking, I can't go in. I can't go, because it was really quite a transactional job where the people who were brilliant at it and there were some people who were brilliant at it, you know, you go in, you're really clear about what you've got to sell. You tell them why they need it. You sell your LucasAid and off you go. Whereas I'd like make friends with everybody and just like get to know them. I get to know a bit about who they were. And, I'm a bit, and, I, and I would just think in my head, I don't think you need any more LucasAid. You've already, you've already got some LucasAid. Whereas we were meant to be selling, you know, the little fridges that you get. And anyway, I was useless at that job. But also, I was very, it really knocked my confidence because I think I was embarrassed. I was quite embarrassed that I was like, I think I got all this expectation of myself and then it didn't really work out. And I felt really stuck. Like I didn't really know who to go to for help or like how to find my way to something different. And I was quite early in my career, so I sort of felt like it was all about climbing that career ladder. And uh, you know, at that time, you sort of think, well, this is it, my career is over, because you get, I get all dramatic about the uh, impact of those lows. So just on your table now, just spend like two minutes um, and have a go at guessing what you think my values might be. I'll then ask people to shout out just in a second, and then we'll, we'll see how we get on. Just take two minutes. I'm just going to get some water. second because it feels weird because so, you're so far back and I'm so that way. Um, hopefully you've just managed to have a quick chat and at least um, you've not just spent the whole time listening to me. Um, I will go back up to the front in a second but I thought I'd come back to come forward. Um, just like shout out so if you were, if you were to guess now some stuff that motivates and drives me what you think my values might be I promise you can't offend me and I've done this loads of, loads of times so you can say whatever you want to say. Um, let's just hear some words what did we get the back? Integrity. Integrity. I'll take that because that makes me feel very good. But yeah, great. Any others? Honesty. Honesty, okay. Compassion. Compassion. Creativity. Creativity, brilliant. We're going to come back to that. Optimism, yeah, great. People, People lovely. Relationships. 
relationships. Any others? Loyalty. Autonomy. Loyalty. Loyalty. I sometimes think, actually, this is a bit of an ego trip. I don't know what I'll say. But I just go, <laughs> these, some of these are not my values. But I'm like, oh, yeah, OK, great. Maybe it's just the way I told the story. Uh, what, do you get any other words? Freedom. What was that one? Oh, ambition, and freedom. ambition and freedom. Very, very good. That's very, those two are very, very close to the exact words. That's, um, that's pretty good going. What did you say? Collaboration. Yeah. Any in here? Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, covered most of them. Okay, so really, really quick exercise and two incredibly short stories. But just to give you a quick sense, so my four values are achievement, ideas, learning, and variety. And so what you sort of started to hear from that, of course you didn't hear the full picture, you just heard a very small slice of two very short moments in my career, but you started to probably get a sense of who I am and what's important to me. And if you want to do this exercise, um, I will just show you quickly, if you want to do this exercise in a bit more detail for yourself, or even um, in pairs back in your organisation, it can be really useful to plot all of the highs and lows of your career. So you end up with a squiggly graph that looks something a bit like this. And then if you look at here, what do these highs have in common? And what can you learn from the lows? What we tend to find is when you're using your strengths and living your values, they're your highs. And when you're having to worry too much about your weaknesses and those values are missing, or as I described, intention, they tend to be your lows. So this, this exercise gives you a much more in-depth way of thinking about your values, really good to do for yourself. But if you're trying to introduce a team to the idea of values, that high-low tends to be um, a very uniting exercise. As long as people know beforehand they're going to do it, and you probably make it time-bound, so say to everyone, you're going to have five minutes or you're going to have ten minutes, it is amazing what you learn in a very short space of time. So I, I always sort of discourage people from seeing values as something to do or to be ticked off a list um, or a process to follow that kind of spits out your values because I'm always a bit suspicious about anything that kind of goes that's going to tell you the answer from doing three things and I think we want people to really think about and reflect on their values but what I think you can do is quite quickly get some clues on people's values and keep kind of building on that um, over time. And coach yourself question on values uh, what does a week well spent look like for me? including weekends. So we do want to be really clear with people that your values are your values in everything that you do and all of who you are, not just, you don't have work values and personal values, you just have what makes you you. You know, I talked about my number one, my number one value, my, my highest value is achievement. And that, you know, probably no surprise that I love sport and that I'm really competitive and I love to play sport. That's one of the ways that my achievement values shows up in, in who I am and how I choose to spend my time. Right, so let's talk a little bit about confidence. And as I mentioned um, at the start, less talking here about the stuff above the surface and more about how can we help people build their self-belief in the long term, those resilience reserves so they're there when we need them. And when we're doing um, sessions just on confidence, we talk about three different areas. We talk about what are the beliefs that you have that hold you back? We describe these as confidence gremlins. So what are those confidence gremlins that we all have um, that are kind of lurking in our brains that get in our way, that hinder us rather than help us? And how can we cage those confidence gremlins? For people who do struggle with um, self-belief and confidence, it's really important that they understand that that is, that is true for everyone. You know, we all have those moments of doubt. I always really like the way that um, there's a brilliant psychologist called Susan David, and she talks about rather than ignoring or avoiding our doubts, we should use our doubts as data. Like, make friends with our fears. And like, what does that, we talk to people about, what does that look like and, and how can you practically stop those beliefs from holding you back? Then we also talk to people about their successes and their relationship with successes, and we're going to do that one together in a second, very quickly. And then the last thing, which is an important point, is making sure people understand that you don't build your belief by yourself. That... Uh, having confidence in yourself is not a kind of solo act. You do need to have the right people around you. Uh, you need to be confident asking for help. You need to make sure you've got the right support system. And that support system needs to have a range of people. People who challenge you, people who sponsor you. And really thinking about, are you creating a career community um, that, that has people who their specific role is to support you in your self-belief? 
So there's sort of three aspects um, that we find are quite helpful for people. Um, and I love this exercise because it's short and always a really, really positive one. So I'd love you to just spend one minute now thinking about one very small success you've had this week and just jot it down. And I'm just going to come and ask for some examples in a second. So one very small success you've had this week, personal or professional, from any aspect of your life. Jot it down and we'll get some examples from around the room in a second. to share some of their very small successes so we can sort of all be inspired by each other. Anyone want to share their very small success? Thank you. I listened to myself. I've been ill for the last week, so I didn't oh. work yesterday, so I could be here today. Perfect. A perfect example of a very small success. Great. So for anyone who didn't hear that, for people at home, just listen to yourself because you're saying didn't feel very well previously, to just rest and recover so that she could be here today. Perfect example of a very small success. Let's have another one. Anyone else? Yes, thank you. Um, I raised a potentially difficult situation to my line manager yesterday. <gasps> Brilliant one. So raised a potentially difficult situation to your manager. How did it go? Good. There we go. Good. Woo! Uh, amazing. I sort of feel like we do need to know the end of that story just to, to make sure we all, we're all still feeling good about it. Okay, any more very small successes? Let's maybe have one more. Anyone? Oh, yeah, very much at the back there. Perfect. Um, Oh, perfect. So if people didn't hear that, managed to encourage somebody to get some help that maybe they're a bit reluctant to get, but actually get some external support for something. Perfect. Sometimes when we think about our very small successes initially, it can feel quite hard. I don't know whether people found that easy or difficult or somewhere in between. But the reason for that is if I ask you to describe in the last year something that's gone really well and something that hasn't gone well, what we tend to find is that people can describe in quite a lot of detail what hasn't gone well. And then for the thing that's gone, um, gone well that you feel good about, I get a few bullet points or you get, the kind of, you get the highlights, but we remember all the details of the mistake that we made or the things, <laughs> the things where you're like, that project was a bit of a disaster or that didn't go as I'd, I'd planned. And that's because, because of that negativity bias that our brains have, our brains are better at remembering and recalling and processing the mistakes that we make or the things that don't go to plan. It's sort of our brains protecting us but kind of unhelpful, really, because we sort of want to focus a bit more on our inner coach than we do our inner critic. And so every time I think um, this exercise is helpful is when we're having those tough moments, we're having a tough day, we're having a tough week, maybe we're having a tough year or a tough, a tough month. This exercise really helps people to remind them of what's going well. You know, sometimes we lose perspective and we sort of veer more towards the pessimism than the kind of the optimism because, you know, we have tough moments. This exercise works particularly well if we just remember the three R's because essentially this is, this is adapted from the world of positive psychology. So first of all, we want to recognise our very small successes. So hopefully I've talked about it long enough now that everybody has at least in their head thought about a very small success they've had this week. The most important thing to do is to write them down. So for everybody who did then write it down on a bit of paper, our brains process information and data in a different way when we write it down. And though you can use the notes section of your phone, I would encourage you, if you're going to do this exercise, write, try and write it uh, with a pen and paper. Because again, you've had to form the words. You've had to take your thoughts and think, well, what's the sentence that I'm going to write? So we sort of connect with that success in a different way and it improves the quality of our reflections. And this is just a really positive process. So I do this in two ways. As I said, whenever I'm having a tough, tough day, tough week, I just do it for myself. 
And I try and write down all the successes in the same place because I think that helps you to just see the positive progress you're making. And I come back to it and I leave it and I come back to it and leave it when I, I don't do this every day. I'm not someone who does journaling. But as a team, as an Amazing If team, we do something every week, which is inspired by this, called Win of the Week. So every Friday we use Teams, Microsoft Teams. We all go into Microsoft Teams. We have a channel called Win of the Week and we all share our one win of the week. And the reason that we do that is this. A, because it helps to make us more resilient and it reminds us of something really good that week, even if it's felt really hard. But also what's lovely is, of course, what we do, which is exactly what we heard there, is you celebrate and you shine a spotlight on everybody else's successes. And it does also often give you a window into other people's worlds. So often we're working in big teams or cross-functional teams, and that win of their week might be... Um, you know, maybe their kid's not been very well that week and you didn't necessarily know that, but they've still managed to get that presentation out. Or um, maybe they've had a difficult conversation or maybe something has gone well in their personal life that they've just not had the opportunity to talk about. The other week, um, someone in our Amazing If team just said her win that week had just been the fact that she'd been able to pick her little girl up from school twice that week. And I hadn't quite appreciated that was as important to her as it, cl as it clearly is. And she talked about... That's what, she, that's what really matters to her and her little girls only just started school. And so it's a really nice way. If you can create habits or form habits as a team that means that you are regularly sharing wins or celebrating successes, it will build collective resilience as well as individual uh, confidence. So it's worth thinking about individual confidence and collective confidence and what can you do to help everybody as well as to help yourself. Now, uh, and the coach staff question... Um, who could I spend time with to build my belief? So back to that point, let's not try and do all of this by ourselves and put too much pressure on ourselves. Networking, um, that lovely phrase that some of us love, some of us don't like. But as I said, let's think about networking as people helping people. We know from the work of people like Adam Grant, uh, a professor over in the US at Wharton, that when we give in our careers that's when we gain so much more as a result. And I think often for people who don't like networking or if you're more introverted like me, when you start with this idea of help, we all feel really good about helping, don't we? Like if I asked you now to describe how do you feel about helping other people, we feel useful, we feel valued, um, we, feel, we get that kind of feel-good factor. There's actually a phrase for it that scientists use that um, apparently when we help someone, we actually get like a genuine like helper's high because of the dopamine that's um, released in our bodies that makes us feel really good. Um, so I was quite like that, the helper's high idea. And so if we think about creating connections and building relationships based on people helping people, I think you start from a very different mindset. And what becomes really important is, well, what have you got to give? Helping people to figure out, well, what have they got to give? And once you've done that then you can start figuring out, well, who are you going to give it to? Who might it, who might it be useful for? And Adam Grant, in his research about giving, when he looked at loads of organisations, he found that it's the givers who are the most successful in organisations. So if you want to make a business case for doing it, that's also the business case. Interestingly, um, and to not forget some of the nuances of the research, the givers um, who do it kind of with, uh, without boundaries or without being specific about what they've got to give are also the least successful. So they're the most and the least. But the givers who are the most successful are the ones that are very clear about what they've got to give and how to give it, and they do it in kind of a boundaried way. So it doesn't mean being completely selfless kind of all of the time. And so I think the obvious place to start, I always think, when we're helping people with what they've got to give, is start with your strengths. Because if you start with your strengths, you've got an opportunity to give something you already enjoy and that you want to spend more time on. And by giving your strengths you make them stronger. If we use our strengths in different situations, then we, will, we, we kind of stress test them in different ways. So it's a, I always think connecting those two ideas is often quite useful. And it's helpful to think about the role that we want to play or the role that we would like to play more of in a network. And four Cs just to have a think about. The first one is being a consumer. So when you're a consumer in a network, it means that you are taking information and insight, and then you are thinking about, how can I give this to someone else? Perfect example today, you're all here today. You might think about, well, I'm consuming this stuff from Sarah. How can I go and give this to someone who might find it helpful? A friend, the team, 
the organisation that I work in, a network that I'm part of. So you've consumed something and then you've given it to other people. There's being a contributor. So that is where you are clear on what you've got to give and you've thought about, well, who would benefit from this and how am I going to think about what I've got to give? For me, what really kind of unlocked my career community was when I figured out the thing that I loved was developing people, I then just looked for as many opportunities as possible to help to develop other people. Sometimes that might mean one person, sometimes that might mean a thousand. And that's looked and felt very different in the different jobs that I've done. At the time, I was probably head of corporate responsibility for Sainsbury's. I wasn't in a job where that was core to my job, but I started to really think about how I spent my time, what I volunteered for, what projects I did, um, you know, different charities that I worked for that were all really about developing people and me bringing that skill because I wanted to make that strength stronger and it was a thing I felt really good about giving. So what have you got to contribute and who are you going to contribute it to? Could you be a connector? Connectors are super valuable. They're the people who spot opportunities to bring people together in your organisation, out of your organisation. Um, some people are natural connectors. Look out for those people. Natural connectors, are, you can just tell they're the people who always know, you know, oh, you'd be really, you should go and meet this person or you should meet that person because connectors love to be asked for help. Go and ask a connector for help. Say, I'm really interested in XXX or I want to learn more about YYY. Do you know anyone who could? And you know those people who are always like, yes, they, they always know someone who could. And I've had a few connectors in my career that you start to realise that the really important thing you, you can do in your relationship with them is let them know how they can help you. The one I really remember, like, you always learn through your mistakes that you make, and we remember them. I was once having a mentoring session with a brilliant lady uh, with a great name. Her name's Silla Snowball, Dame Silla Snowball. And I was so happy and sort of um, a bit overwhelmed, I think, by the fact she was giving me her time that I'd not really prepared. I was sort of, I was a bit in awe of her, I think. And within five minutes of meeting her, she just said to me, right, Sarah, how can I help you? All she wanted to do was help. And I'd not really got an answer. And what I could have said to her was, well, I'm trying to get better at this skill or I'm really looking for people in this area. Whereas when I met my previous boss from Sainsbury's last week, I said to her, oh, Sarah, also called Sarah, uh, do you know anyone who is also running quite fast-growing global companies that, but that are still quite small, still very much kind of small organisations? Because all of my connections in the main are in big organisations. So I could, do, I could do with a few new people and a few new connections in organisations a bit more like Amazing If. And so straight away she could say, yeah, what about this person, what about that person? And she can faci facilitate those introductions, which as an introvert is much easier than kind of doing the whole cold reaching out thing. So if you can be a connector, do that, because that's such a valuable thing. But don't be afraid to ask for those connections, because you never know who knows who. And if a network doesn't exist that you want to be part of, create it. Creating networks is time consuming, so just be a bit careful. But also think about who could you create a network with. A network can be three people. A network can be 100% virtual. One of the most valuable networks I'm part of exists pretty much purely on WhatsApp. And it's a group of authors who come from the business world who are all writing business books. And that group is incredibly supportive, all on each other's side, um, brilliant at asking questions. We go to each other with conundrums about what to do and where we might go and how publishing works, which is still a bit of a mystery. But we're, you know, we're all there to support each other. And that was created by this one guy who just said, oh, we've kind of all got this one thing in common. Would this be helpful to kind of come together? And it is amazing how well that network works. So just, I always think, just think about with your careers and when you're supporting people with their careers, have people got a kind of good range of people in their career community? And are they thinking again, really consciously about continually building and investing in those relationships? Because sometimes we only think about networking in that moment where we want to make a change. And I always think that's um, much too late for people. Um, and I think this is a really good question, uh, which I think... Again, if you're, not, if you're a bit more nervous about networking, helps people to get started. So what would I like to learn from my network in the next 12 months? So rather than just thinking, I need to know people, I don't think networking is people knowing people. I think it's more about people growing people. And so what do I want to learn? And therefore, that, um, I think that helps to focus my energy and efforts, helps me to think about where am I going to invest my time? What does good look like? Last area to think a little bit about, this idea of possibilities. Um, 
again, in most organizations we work with, we all want to move away from these very kind of specific career plans because we recognize they're unrealistic um, into much more about exploring possibilities. What most people need help with is well, how, how do I do that? Sometimes it's about permission. It's about being in a safe and supportive environment where I can have these kind of career conversations. And also it's a bit about giving people some frameworks. So often when we're doing big workshops on this area, we give people lots of different frameworks to kind of pick and choose from and, and hopefully things that people are, can just keep repeating. But I thought I'd just share one of them with you today. So the first thing I always want people to think about is of course, what are their most obvious possibilities? These are the ones they'll already be thinking about. But I think it's good for people to say these out loud. You know, I'd like to go and do, I want to be promoted or I want to do a sideways move into this area. And then to start asking people and asking yourself, okay, well, why is that, why is that role interesting for you? Like, how do, how do you think your strengths would transfer into that team? Um, what is it that excites you about that possibility? Let's stress test those obvious possibilities to make sure that they do stretch our strengths, that they do align with our values. And sometimes they will do. So nothing wrong with the obvious ones, but the obvious choice is not always the optimal choice. Uh, I'm stealing that from a good podcast that I listened to uh, last week. Next one, let's get people to talk a bit about their ambitious possibilities. Uh, ambit ambition is an interesting word. I think um, there's a brilliant book by a lady called Shelley Archambault, who is the first black CEO in Silicon Valley. She wrote a book called Unapologetically Ambitious. And sometimes we don't like using this word ambition, but I want people to be ambitious for what they can achieve in their careers in a kind of, in a personalized way. We want people to have careers as individual and as brilliant as they are. So I want to know what's the thing that people don't dare to say out loud? What's the thing that they don't know how to do yet, but they're really intrigued by and they're really motivated by? Uh, let's encourage people to kind of explore their aspirations and their potential a bit more and to say those things out loud. You know, maybe it's a short-term thing, maybe it's a medium-term thing, but I think it is good to, to help people to think about those things. Then thinking a bit about pivots. And again, you can do all of these things in and out of your organization. I think it's always good to think about both at the same time. So you might pivot back to something you've done before. The idea of going backwards, um, it's always quite interesting in careers. No one likes the idea of going backwards, but I think that's changing. So I could go back and work in corporate responsibility. Actually, I've missed corporate responsibility. I really liked working in that area. And so some of the non-executive stuff that I do, I very intentionally try and work in that space because I sort of, I don't want to pivot all of my working time back into corporate responsibility, but I would like to pivot a bit more back to it, to, to some of the time. Um, and there's actually a non-exec that I do, which is co-chairing a board for the Mayor of London about affordable workspaces, which is very kind of corporate responsibility based, nothing to do with my day job and, and kind of amazing if. So you can pivot back and you can re-explore things that you've enjoyed before. Or you can pivot forward, and I think this is an area we're spending much more time on, which we sometimes describe as, how can you squiggle and stay? So how can you transfer your talents, your skills and your strengths into new teams, into new areas of your organization? Lots of the organizations we're working with are trying to figure out how can we encourage more flow in the organization? Because we can't all move up all of the time, and also we want to kind of move away from that ladder-like thinking. And there's new teams there, and there's new skills emerging. And how can we help people not feel like they are confined by just what they've done before? Which is really interesting. And then the last one, because it's fun, um, and it's good to get people to talk about them, what are the dream possibilities? So if you took away constraints and limitations other than you've got to work, what would you be spending your time doing? It's also really interesting when you're sometimes talking to people about their dream possibilities. Sometimes even just by talking about them, they realize there are actions they could take right now that might help them to explore their possibilities a bit further. What we really want this almost mind mapping exercise to do is to prompt people to think, for your possibilities that are a priority for you right now, what do you need to know and who can help you? So we kind of want to take this from encouraging people to think in quite an unfiltered way, to be very explorative and very curious, and then to go into the so what. So if I've got, um, you'll have way more than four, so let's just add a few more on. So maybe you've got three or four obvious possibilities. Let's add on a few more ambitious ones. And then actually saying to people, okay, so in the next 12 months, which of these feel like the ones you really want to actively explore? Okay, you've got one here, you've got one here. Okay, so what, like, what don't you know? And who do you think could help you? 
and to really then encourage people to go and to have curious conversations, to build relationships, spot what gaps you've got, work out how your skills and strengths could be useful. Work out sometimes that when you go and explore this, let's take this one, I go and explore this ambitious possibility, I realise it's not right for me. That's a really good use of my time because perhaps I've gone to do some shadowing, perhaps I've gone and had some conversations and thought, oh, the, once I've got a window into their world, the reality of their day-to-day -day isn't what I'd expected or, or isn't what I'd seen from a distance. And now I know a bit more, this thing over here looks a bit more interesting. It's how I ended up in that um, really good role that I talked to you about that I was very enthusiastic about. I thought I wanted to go and work in TV advertising. I did some of that exploring. And the more I learnt, the more I realised I was never going to be right for that role. I was never going to excel in that role. It needed good attention to detail. It needed lots of project plans, which um, were not my forte. And here's a good coach self question just to finish with. Who could I have a curious career conversation with to explore my possibilities? I always think, try and have once a quarter a conversation with someone where you're just being really curious. And like, when was the last time you did that? Some people do it all the time, but for lots of us, it doesn't end up being a kind of priority because we're, we're all so busy kind of getting our jobs done. So quick visual summary for you of the ideas for action that we talked through. Energy audit, at my best strengths feedback, that high low for values, very small successes for confidence and resilience, how to think about what you've got to give and the four C's, and then really just getting people to explore their possibilities. would really encourage you now to just think about, well, what's the action today that you want to take after, after hearing what I've got to say? I hope that there's been something in the last kind of 50 minutes or so where you thought, I really want to go and do that for myself. I really want to go and do that for someone else. And that's how we make our learning last is not only just kind of being present and absorbed in hopefully what I've got to say today, but you going to do something with it, you making it your own. Um, if it's helpful, after today, we'll share a playlist of things for you to read, watch and listen to on each of those five areas to learn more. Some of those will be from us. Um, we've just had a Harvard Business Review article published on learning, unlearning and relearning. So that might be relevant. But also some of those things will not be from us. Uh, podcasts that we think are really useful, articles to read, books to read, that kind of stuff. Um, you can get in touch with me at any time. I'm just Sarah at amazingif.com. Um, if you're into Instagram and you like our sort of stuff on Instagram, we're just at Amazing If. Um, and our Squiggly Careers podcast now has about 250 episodes. We've been doing it weekly for three years. Um, I think it's the, the thing I've committed to the most in my life ever. Um, so hopefully on most topics you can think of, certainly on everything we've talked about today, um, there is a podcast episode, again, if you find that useful. But I hope this has been helpful for you. Um, I hope it's energised you and it's useful and it's something you can take away and do something with. Um, really appreciate you all coming along to the session. Thank you. Thank you.